It's going to be an exciting afternoon here and an exciting evening. We are billing this part of the program as the Friday night debates, and we're beginning not at night, but at 1.30 in the afternoon on the topic of Islam, threat or not. To moderate the panel, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the war correspondent for World Net Daily, one of the most watched uh, internet sites in the world, a uh, frequent traveler to Afghanistan, the Middle East, uh, and Europe, where, among other things, uh, he is a panelist on the French version of Meet the Press. So if you're a fan of Kiosk in Paris, you already know Matthew Sanchez. Please join me in welcoming him now and the very difficult task of getting this program going. Okay. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, just a couple of personal comments. Before I became a war correspondent, uh, I had the pleasure of going to Kuwait and going into Iraq with our troops, American forces. And I met a lot of different people. My idea about Islam was very limited. But I recall being a Ramadi and celebrating R Ramadan and being with a lot of different people who were Muslims and uh, and just feeling how much it resembled Christmas. Uh, people got together, families ate, and it was a big celebration. There was nothing violent about it. That was always juxtaposed with acts of violence that took place from Islamists who, during that Ramadi celebration in 1997 of last year, exploded uh, a car bomb and ended up killing up killing the host of the party where I was that day, and that was a gentleman named Sheikh Sitar. So is Islam a threat or is it a peaceful religion? Honestly, I couldn't tell you, and I think a lot of you are here asking some of the same questions. How much of a threat and how much of an involvement we in the United States will have with this force that seems to be growing? Here to discuss this are two gentlemen who are much more intelligent than I ever will be on the subject. Um, I'm going to bring up Dr. Daniel Peterson. He's a professor of Islamic studies at Brigham Young University. He has completed a biography on the life of Muhammad. To debate the doctor will be Robert Spencer. Robert Spencer, uh, you may know him by some of the the books that he, he has two New York Times bestsellers. One is uh, The Truth About Muhammad, and uh, he's also published The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam. So these gentlemen will, will be debating and hopefully will answer some of those questions that a lot of you here are wondering as well. At the very end, I, I hope to open up the debate to you and have you ask our panelists some questions. Okay, without any further ado, let's bring up Dr. Daniel Peterson from Brigham, Brigham Young University. There's no clear answer to the question whether Islam is violent or peaceful. For one thing, there's no single platonic archetype somewhere out there called Islam. There are and always have been competing Islams, each claiming to be the authentic one, just as there's no single monolithic Judaism but rather as the great scholar Jacob Neusner has observed, Judaisms, and just as they're Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Quaker, and many other Christianities. Sunni Islam differs from Shi'i Islam, and Sunni Islam alone recognizes as Orthodox four distinct schools of legal thought, and this isn't to mention Sufi or mystical Islam, which transcends the Sunni-Shiite divide, nor such sects as the Wahhabis and others. Further, the question's too black and white. Obviously, one cannot simplistically pronounce Islam a religion of peace, Muhammad was neither a proto-Gandhi nor some kind of 7th century Arabian flower child. But it's an equal and opposite error to depict Islam simplistically as an ideology of hatred, violence, and oppression. Like every other religious faith and every other institution involving humans, Islam's historical record is mixed. With those cautions stated, a better way of phrasing the topic of today's discussion would be, is Islam inherently violent in all its forms or not? To which my answer is no. Before I set forth some of my reasons for this answer in the painfully limited period allotted, so many disagreements, so little time, permit me to say where I'm not coming from. 
I'm neither a Muslim nor an apologist for Islam. I'm a believing Christian, nor am I a left-winger or a cultural relativist. I don't believe that the Islamic world is beyond criticism, and I see much to criticize. I don't think that the connection between Islam and terrorist violence is accidental or coincidence. Moreover, I'm a movement conservative, for what it's worth, with libertarian leanings, a subscriber to National Review since I was 13, who supports the surge in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan. I am, however, a student of Islam and of Islamic intellectual history. Muslims currently represent nearly a quarter of the human race, and they're not likely to go away anytime soon, nor are they likely to simply walk away from their faith. So my fundamental question to those who claim that Islam properly understood is inherently violent, that it's inescapably hostile to liberty and Western civilization, is this, what would you have us do? I don't suppose, though Sam Harris comes close, that anybody seriously proposes a Western war of annihilation against the world's roughly 1.3 billion Muslims. But if Islam is inherently violent and hostile, I see no real alternative to a permanent state of war between the West and Islam. I reject the idea. Unfortunately, though, I think that our harshest Western critics make such a clash of civilizations more likely. How? Because ironically, in privileging those readings of Islam that demand a permanent state of war between the Dar al-Islam, the abode of Islam or submission, and the Dar al-Harb, the abode of war, a pair of entirely non-Quranic phrases, incidentally, they read it exactly as our most ardent and implacable enemies do. And in arguing that this is the only true and legitimate understanding of Islam, they agree with Sayyid Qutb, Osama bin Laden, Ayman al-Zawahiri, and other extremists in declaring moderate Muslims to be kufar, or infidels. This seems to me catastrophically wrong-headed, not only because it's historically mistaken, but perhaps even more importantly because it undercuts members of the Muslim community whom we ought to be cheering on. A few weeks ago, I was driving with a Muslim friend in Jordan. We're living in a stupid period of Islamic history, he told me. I hope that people won't judge all of Islam, Islamic civilization, and Islamic history by this stupid period. To that, in the context of this discussion, I add my hope that we in the West won't do anything to support stupidity or to delegitimize intelligence among our Muslim neighbors. The old Latin precept, first do no harm, can and should apply to intercultural relations as well as to medicine. Modern Mujahideen do not believe they are hijacking Islam, Robert Spencer rightly notes. They believe they're restoring its proper interpretation, and they're successfully convincing peaceful Muslims around the world that they're correct. And they will continue to do so for as long as peaceful Muslims fail to formulate new and non-literalist ways of interpreting the Quran and the words and deeds of Muhammad. In his books, however, Mr. Spencer effectively argues that the Wahhabis and Al-Qaeda and their fellow travelers represent true Islam. Far from being extremists or perverters of the faith, he writes, they interpret its texts correctly. They are the people who actually dare to do what Allah says to do. He argues that non-Muslims who don't recognize this live in a fantasy world, and most crucially, that moderate Muslims, to the extent that they exist, are moderates either because they aren't serious Muslims or because they're ignorant of the real teachings of their faith. This is precisely the position of Sayyid Qutb and the other founders of today's militant Islamism. If true, it would be deeply disheartening. It would suggest that if Muslims learn about their faith and follow it, they must logically practice the jihadi extremist form of Islam. In my judgment, however, this idea is not true. As outlined in John Kelsey's important book, Arguing the Just War in Islam, there's a serious intra-Islamic conversation going on, and the moderates have a case. And I could not possibly disagree more strongly with Mr. Spencer and the Wahhabis when they claim that the mystical or Sufi tradition of Islam, which has often expressed itself peacefully and tolerantly, is not true Islam. To oppose aggressive military jihad, Mr. Spencer says, would be to turn against Islam itself. In seeing the war on terror as, not just as a war against Islam, but as a war on behalf of Christianity, Mr. Spencer writes, the view of bin Laden and other jihad terrorists neatly coalesces with that of the anti-Christian theocracy writers like Chris Hedges and Kevin Phillips. Mr. Spencer's full-throated sustained defense of the Crusades as justified defensive warfare and his expressions of gratitude to the Crusaders suggest that he, Hedges, Phillips, and Osama aren't so very far apart on this matter. And no Muslim who opens to the frontispiece of Mr. Spencer's politically incorrect guide uh, to Islam to see the two words that appear alone and in all capital letters on it, Deus Vult, is likely to be reassured. Deus Vult, Latin for God wills it, was the cry of the people at the declaration of the First Crusade by Pope Urban II in 1095. Even many conservatives shy away from naming the enemy, Mr. Spencer writes, for fear that it means war against a billion Muslims. But if Mr. Spencer's arguments are granted, doesn't it? It's a PC myth, he has written, in the context of a discussion not of fringe terrorists, but of mainstream Islam and Islamic history, that we can negotiate with these people, quote-unquote. 